Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're excited to have over 230 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one credit from the ACI. Let's get started by giving one lucky attendee a Webinar Wednesday lunch bag for answering this trivia question. Which city is hosting the 2019 Super Bowl? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to invite everyone to our MD Expo 4 conference, which takes place next week, October the 5th to 7th, in Seattle. HTM professionals from across the nation will be joining us for three days of learning, networking, and the latest advances in technology, products, and services. There's still time to register, so register now for free using promo code HTMROCKS. Details can be found at mdexposhow.com forward slash Seattle. Okay, and let's see who the winner of our Webinar Wednesday lunch bag is. And it is uh, Adam Shelter. Congratulations, Adam. The correct answer is Atlanta. Webinar Wednesday, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Oxford Instruments Healthcare. Oxford, Oxford Instruments Healthcare specializes in providing CT and MRI maintenance services, equipment sales, mobile imaging solutions, and quality parts to healthcare facilities throughout the US. With a dedicated team of highly skilled professionals, real-time field service management technology, OIVision remote system health monitoring, and a nationwide service footprint, Oxford Instruments Healthcare delivers world-class service and support. The Oxford Instruments Healthcare team strictly adheres to our ISO 13485 certified processes to ensure quality to our customers and correspondingly have achieved an unmatched reputation for quality and integrity while providing much needed cost savings and value to its customers. For more information, visit healthcare.oxinst.com. Our presenter today is John Garrett, Director of Clinical Engineering for Catholic Health Initiatives. John, you may begin whenever you're ready. All right. Well, first, I'd like to say thank you for everyone uh, spending some time with us today. And I'll uh, get started here. We're going to talk about leveraging data and adding value uh, within healthcare systems. So who is this guy who's on the phone talking to you right now? My name's John Garrett. And uh, I have uh, 21 years that I specifically worked in medical imaging service. So I was turning wrenches all that time. Um, I worked multi-vendor, multi-modality, everything except MRI, and even then, a little bit of that. Uh, I did PACS integration and administration. Um, I also worked with, uh, before I go on to this next line, I also worked quite a bit with um, the biomeds that worked throughout our hospitals. We always worked as a team, and uh, I went on to get my uh, bachelor's in science in health and human services management, and I recently finished up a, a master's in psychology. I'm um, currently, as she said, a director of clinical engineering Catholic Health Initiatives, and that's in Texas, is where I'm located. So let's get right into it and let's talk about leveraging data. But to talk about le leveraging data, we first need to answer a few questions and make sure that we understand what we're talking about when we say we're going to leverage data. First, we have to know what data are we going to collect. That's uh, very important as we don't want to collect things that aren't really important what data is actually valuable to us. How are we collecting the data? Now this, this actually is very important and I'm gonna go into quite a bit of detail about this in just a minute. And how are we accessing the data? So how is data being collected? Let's talk about that. <clears throat> Anyone that is in my shop has heard me talk about data and documenting everything we do with equipment, right? So we have to have a data collection method in place. Um, Everybody that meets CMS requirements currently has some form of data collection in place currently. Um, the data should be collected using a searchable and relational database. That's just a fancy way of saying you should have a digital way of recording your data. Uh, believe it or not, um, in the last year, I have run across a independent service organization that had not yet moved to digital uh, documentation. They were still writing out handwritten um, service tickets and filing them uh, from triplicate copies. Uh, that's really, if you are doing that, it's not going to be very useful. Um, because 
as this says, it should be a web-based system where you should be able to access it remotely. Uh, that way you can document your, your work anywhere uh, that you go. It should have, okay, so this is single query line ability. That's just fancy database talk to say you should be able to search it with a uh, mod uh, question. You can basically search your database by asking for specific data. All right, and ideally you should be able to, to request specific or customized searches within that. Let's talk a little bit about access, uh, accessing the data. Um, we're going to talk about two basic breakdowns. First, we're going to talk about the really large medical systems. Um, in those, you need to have an individual or a very small team, I would say typically no more than two or three, of people that keep all the data straight. So this includes standardizing the models, making sure that um, we have the data in a format that is actually usable, right? So like I said, standardized models, uh, also making sure that um, if you're connecting uh, locations to the models that you have at those locations, you need to make sure that that is all in line and there needs to be one quality control person, or like I said, a small team. Um, they should also have a contact for reports on multiple locations. So the reason that's important is if you work at a specific healthcare facility, whether it's a hospital or an imaging center or a standalone ER, uh, you may not have access to all of the regional data or all the national data on uh, equipment throughout the country or region, et cetera. There needs to be a person you can contact to get that information so that you can compare your system to other systems and so that you can also see how you fit into the whole because some of the stuff we're going to talk about uh, knowing that you're an exception to the rule might be just as important as knowing what your numbers are all right so the medium to small systems typically you're going to have a keeper of all the data but it's also likely to be the same person that can search local uh, or multiple locations and actually process uh, any special requests things like that so what are what are we going to do with all this data well first I want to talk about unit years because we're going to use unit years um, for a lot of the calculations and a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about so unit years right it's the sum of each unit time in operation that sounds kind of vague and nonspecific. So I wrote out an example that if you have a CT that's three years old and a CT of the same model that's five years old and a CT the same model that's a year old, if you add all those years together, you get nine. So nine would be nine unit years. This is important because you also have to realize, as the uh, disclaimer at the bottom says, there are limitations to this. If you have two CTs and one is 10 years old and one is one year old, that's a lot different than having two CTs where one is six years old and one is five years old because a 10 year old CT is going to have a lot more service history and going to have a lot more, you would expect a, a, quite a few more breakdowns um, as you move towards the end of its life. So it would be um, expected Anyone who, you know, if you think about it logically, it's just very linear, that if you have a CT that's only two years old, you would have a lot fewer breakdowns, a lot fewer problems than you would if your CT was 10, 11 years old. Now, this works across the board. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about uh, a pump, like an infusion pump, or a, a hemodialysis unit. Any equipment in the hospital, that's basically going to be true. There's very few things where the service stands tends to stay the same over 10 or 15 years. Also, you, uh, you have to consider if you have units that are beyond expected life or beyond um, support and service, that might also give you the number of unit years you want, but it may skew your data a little bit. And you have to be very aware of that, that all of these things are based on general concepts of averages and statistics. So if we go forward and we talk about what data is collected, all the data that is collected and that we're going to talk about, you should be collecting already to meet the requirements for CMS, for a joint commission, 
or any licensing body. All right, this is stuff that should be already collected and in your database. If you're missing any of this, um, you may want to review with um, your director or vice president or whomever is in, who's responsible to make sure that you're getting all of this data collected to make sure that you're meeting the requirements needed. And this includes whether you're an in-house system or an independent service organization, doesn't matter, any of those uh, would need to collect all of the same data. So first of all, you're going to have the equipment man manufacturer. That could be Baxter, that could be Medtronic, that could be General Electric, that could be Siemens, anybody who makes the medical equipment, obviously. The model of the unit, the date you purchased it, and the cost of the equipment, and that's capital dollars. What capital money was spent um, to purchase this. This will become important in later, later calculations, but it's also important to know as you go forward, just so that when you go to buy new equipment, you can show the cost uh, value ratios. It's important to note that the models can have subcategories. So I'm going to go to the big iron, and it's easy to see the difference if you have a CT that has a 16 slice versus a 64 slice. Um, those, you might, it might be the same model, but it can have a subcategory of the 16 or the 64. You would want to record this, although you won't necessarily use it in every calculation. Okay. This is something I can't stress enough, um, adjusting the cost when something is upgraded. So I have to go back and define upgrade versus repair. When um, it wasn't long ago, uh, specifically General Electric had upgraded their um, imaging computers on some of the old light speed CTs. I go to CTs because they have a lot of parts in them and it's easy to make a lot of examples from. So they had uh, to upgrade that computer if you wanted the latest and greatest. So a lot of people chose to upgrade their computers. And when they did, um, that cost for many hospital systems was just lost in the ether as far as documentation uh, for the things that we're looking at. Um, I'm sure it showed up in a spreadsheet for that year's um, for that year's budget, but it didn't show up two years later if you were trying to figure out your cost of ownership. So it's important that you find a way to adjust the cost when upgraded. This may simply be going back to where you listed your cost of equipment and then changing that number to include the upgrade cost. It could also be listed as a separate category as a uh, a sublisting within that piece of equipment as it's in your database, but you want to make sure you capture that cost. Um, it's often missed, so people often don't have accurate data due to the fact that they simply don't think to update the cost of the equipment when it is upgraded. All right, so we need to capture each service event and the cost of that event. Now, that event itself might be different depending on what you have involved with that, obviously. So each event should be labeled as preventative maintenance, downtime, repair, misuse, or cannot duplicate. These will break it down so you can find the real cost of the service event. Because if you have a cannot duplicate, that means you didn't spend parts. That means you, didn't, you probably have minimal time for man hours. And so you can look at the cost being only man hours. Right. If you have um, downtime because of that cannot duplicate and you show that you're showing over long periods of time a great deal of downtime related to cannot duplicates, then it may indicate that you need to bring in training for the operators. Um, there's a number of things you can calculate by making sure that you break down what type of service it was. Right. So the cost of the event itself should be broken down into travel costs, parts costs, time and labor, downtime, and outside service. Now, not every incident will have costs under all of these. Some of these will have zero. For example, if you are working on something in-house, you may have no travel. If you fix it because something needed adjusted instead of replacing something, there'll be no parts. Time and labor you typically would always have some price in there. Downtime would also be equivalent, typically recorded in time, not necessarily money, but that translates to money, and I will show you that later. And of course, any outside service costs. So if you look at something that has, let's say you have something on contract, uh, there's no cost except for the downtime. 
because the cost is already in the contract and that's calculated for something else, right? Um, if you have a piece of equipment that breaks and you work on it in-house and then you find out you can't quite fix it, you might have parts, time and labor, and then also outside services where you called someone else in to fix it. Uh, for the example of something that intends to be a, uh, re a replacement or a trade-in, you would simply have the cost of the outside service. Um, or you might list that under parts, but it's still simply going to be a one charge and the others would be zero except for downtime. All right, so let's talk about the importance of the data. Um, the value of data is directly related to the validity of the data. So anybody that's been around computers for any length of time has heard garbage in, garbage out, right? We have to make sure that the data we are basing our decisions on is accurate data. That's why I talked about it earlier. It, it really matters what you have to look at, how accurate it is. If you have people putting in inaccurate data, then you're making inaccurate decisions. It's that simple. Um, the idea of having uh, standardized modalities, um, if we enter, if we, have a, if we buy 800 infusion pumps and half of them are listed as infusion pumps and the other half are listed as pumps, when we go to pull our data, we may only ever be pulling half of the data we need to make our decision. So it's very important that we have data entered the same way and make sure that that data is accurate. All right, which is the next sign, it has to be done accurately. So not only do we have to make sure that it's entered um, for the right modality, we have to make sure that the cause of the, of, of the problem is correctly documented. We have to make sure that we have it listed under the correct uh, heading of, is it a preventive maintenance? Is it um, misuse and abuse, right? And so to do that, we really should be investing in training for documentation. This within the industry is one of our biggest, um, in my humble opinion, is one of our biggest shortcomings. We assume that since someone has been through the training, maybe they've been in the field several years, that you know they'll be able to document it correctly. Yet, over and over, I see that we do not have a standardized um, documentation, even within the same company, because time has not been spent to train each individual on how they should be entering that documentation. It doesn't have to be six months of training, but everyone should be should have time where they are sat down with whoever's setting the expectation and show them exactly what a proper um, work order looks like, how each in incident is correctly documented, how each new piece of equipment is added to the equipment. Right? So, require timely data entry. Now, there, this, this is always a point of contention because everyone's always busy, and they say, I will document what I've done later. The problem with this is that um, as we get further away from the event, what we remember happened, it deteriorates. So, our, how accurate our information may be um, is questionable after so much time. I like to see all uh, documentation done within 48 hours. It doesn't always happen, but it is important that it is recorded in a timely manner so you get as much of the accurate data as you can. Now, if you, in the case of the cost, you may have invoices that you can enter so you can look at those at any time. However, um, the notes and things that you put into your uh, event may not be quite as accurate if you wait too long simply because we all have a lot going on and we can get easily distracted. All right, so we want to delineate the PMs, the misuse, the repairs. As I've gone over that again and again, I'm, I'll tell you what, I just won't beat that to death, but it's important. <laughs> right, so this is in red because you can only search what you have put into it. You can't find things that are not there. Right, so that's why the data itself is so very important. Okay, so now that we've talked about the data and I've kind of beat that to death, I think what we'll do now is we'll talk about mean time to failure. Right? So, 
What is mean time to failure? Basically, it just means how often do we expect a piece of equipment to have a problem. And so to calculate that, we have to look at the total number of failures divided by unit years. Now, we talked about unit years already. So if we have 100 pumps that we've had for two years, we have 200 unit years. And if we've had, uh, say, you know, 400 failures, then you're averaging, what's that, two, your, your number of, your mean time to failure would be twice a year, be every six months. Because your, your number will be two, you're basing it on years. So let me go through this a little bit slower. If we have, let's, let's do it with smaller numbers, something easy. Let's say you have uh, 10 failures. So I just gave you the backwards numbers. But, so you have 10 failures and you have 10 units, unit years. So whether you have one unit for 10 years or whether you have 10 units for one year, you have 10 unit years. Right? Your total number of failures is 10. That means you expect it to fail once a year. If you had 20 failures and 10 unit years, you expect it to fail uh, twice a year. You can run those numbers and it'll, it'll break it out. And just remember you're doing years. So if you want to break it into months, you can do it that way. You just have to calculate your unit years into unit months, which a unit year is obviously 12 months. So you can multiply your unit years times 12 to get unit months. However, typically... We're talking unit years, so going forward, I'm going to stick to the unit years, and we'll we'll go to that that route. Now, unit years will equal the sum of years of a specific model, or it can even be a submodel. Here's where you decide how specific you want to be. Do you want to be specific about the CT model or the CT16 or the CT64, or do you want to be uh, you can even choose in this in this specific case. You can choose maybe you only want um, to do this for one location. Maybe you want to do it for multiple locations. This is where you're going to specify the number of years for that model that are in either multiple locations, a single location. Um, it's really up to you, but you have to remember the scope of what you're setting here because you also have to match that scope with your number of failures. So if you do a if you do a specific model for an entire healthcare system, in our case CHI, we have uh, over 100 hospitals. So that means we also have to make sure that we would pull the no total number of failures for that model for the entire hospital system. That way is the way we get um, accurate uh, data to use. Now you want to recalculate this for every use, and I say that because. You want to make sure, A, that you're getting the right data for the right scope, but you also want to make sure that you have the up-to-date data. So if you're updating every 48 hours, your, doc your documentation is falling within every 48 hours. If we use this calculation uh, today, a week from now, it, should, it may be very different. All right? But now what does the mean time to failure really tell us? Well, obviously... How often do we expect a failure? Right. But it can also tell us how many units should a specific location have or a hospital system have, depending on the area that it goes that it covers. And it can also answer, should we have some spare parts on hand? All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to use mean time to failure to calculate the right sizing of equipment. Now, what we're really asking is, are there enough units at this location? That's the question that we're trying to answer. So how do we do that with mean time of failure? Well, we have to capture the downtime cost due to failure. Now, this is important that we make sure that it's failure and not PMs or misuse. Downtimes for PM are required. That's just part of the cost of doing business. So you cannot count that for an accurate answer to your question. Misuse also falls under, uh, mis can be misguided because if we have things failing over and over because of misuse, as I previously mentioned, we need to make sure that we're getting the training needed for that, uh, for those operators to make sure that we're not having failure that is preventable, right? Um, 
So we're just looking at downtime due to failure. Right, so then we have to look at how much revenue is brought in per day or hour. I can guarantee you that a director of whatever department it is can tell you how much money they're losing if they're down. If you doubt me, just wait until something breaks that they have to have to, to keep their unit open, and you will hear in great detail how much money they're losing every second. Okay, so um, we're going to take that, and, and they will give us a very accurate, well, if they're under stress, they might not be as accurate as if we simply ask them when things are running well. <laughs> so you should find out from that department, you know, how much they're losing uh, per day or per hour, depending on how you're trying to calculate it. And then we have to know what's our average downtime per failure. Now, I had mentioned earlier that we have to document downtime. We have to document downtime because if we don't, we can't answer this question. What's our average downtime? Right? So if we uh, talk about when it fails, how often, how long is it typically down, that's going to be calculated into the next mathematical equation, which is this simple. Take your mean time to failure, how many times it's going to fail, your, fail in a year, times your average downtime, and times the revenue that's lost. This will give you your cost per unit per year of downtime. So I'm going to show an example, right? So if your mean time to failure is three months, right? So every three months, you're going to have a failure. And I just realized the math on this is wrong, so hopefully somebody else spotted that. So three months failure, which means it'll fail four times a year, and one day average downtime, times 10,000. So if you have four failures a year, times one day, times 10,000, that would actually be 40,000 per unit per year. And if you had three units, that would actually be 120,000 per year, and that's just lost income due to failure downtime. Right? So we could say three failures a year and make that math all work instead of three months. But that comes down to three units would, would be equal 90,000 if you have three failures a year. Okay. So this assumes a total loss of revenue. Now, the comment there may be modified by a rescheduling factor. Here's another twist you can add into that, depending on how far you want to go into the weeds. If you take um, the fact that, say, these units, um, three units are only running at 70% of capacity, maximum capacity. They, they only scheduled, they're only, all three of them are only scheduled 70% per day, typically. You may be able to reschedule patients um, for, some of the, for an item, and so maybe you actually would have to multiply that again by um, 0.2 or 3 or 8, depending on how much you actually lost, because a patient goes, you know what, I'm going to go across the street to another hospital and get this done. So depending on how far you want to go into the weeds, depending on if anybody has that information, that's one that sometimes is difficult to find out is if these units are down, if one of these units is down, how many patients are we scheduled versus how many patients do we lose? But you can still ask and a director may know that. All right. So one of my favorites is using a mean time to failure to calculate spare parts. I personally am going to give you a big, um, oh, basically I don't like to keep spare parts. Most people don't because it's money sitting on your shelf. Now, the reason I put this into this um, presentation is because there are people in critical access hospitals. There are people uh, that service units that are high use, whether it's an independent service organization, whether it's in-house, um, it doesn't matter, whether it's a manufacturer. This calculation tells you if you should have specific spare parts on hand, right? So there's one of the biggest things you have to realize that this calculation is specific to one specific failure of a, of a device. So an easy one to use is an x-ray tube on any, on any device that has an x-ray tube. We can tell if we need to have a spare part of an x-ray tube available. It could be a power supply. I mean, it can be any part of a bigger unit, right? So 
the way you do this, this is calculated based on purchase dates of parts instead of failures. How often are you buying this part? Well, if you are documenting uh, properly, then when, every time you've replaced a specific part, that part will be listed and associated with that device. So if I'm replacing a uh, power supply, then every time I replace it, that should be in the database. Um, this is another reason for standardization. And this gets a little harder to do because when you go to buy parts, if you don't buy them, even if you do buy them from the manufacturer, sometimes those part numbers change. And you have to know if those part numbers have changed to make sure that you can actually see it. Or you have to be able to use your database in a manner that allows you to see how many times a power supply was changed or a tube was changed within that or on that uh, piece of equipment. Typically, like I said, an x-ray tube is easy, but if you start talking about power supplies or switches or any number of other items that you might have multiples of in a bigger complex unit, you might have four or five different power supplies in the unit, and you need to know if it was that power supply. Otherwise, you're going to have faulty data, right? So we look at the number of times that part was ordered, and we divide it by the unit years. Right? So if you're doing this over four or five items, that means that you have to go get the number of times a part was ordered for that unit, and you need to divide it by the total number of unit years for that unit. This also, again, I'm giving a warning. It gets a little more complex because if you ordered a part and you saw that it was ordered twice within three days, chances are you've got a bad part and you have to discount one of those uh, orders. But you have to go in and check it. That's why this one's a little more complex to do, takes a little bit more time. Then we look at the mean time to failure of the part times the average downtime when that part fails and times the revenue or the cost of the downtime. Now, again, it's a little more involved because you have to go, when you see that that part was ordered, you have to look at the work orders from that time and get the time that that your average downtime for just that part. Now you can sub, you can uh, substitute the average downtime that we have already calculated, but you have to realize that that will skew your results and give you a much less accurate uh, decision making tool. So the other thing, so basically what you're going to look at and say, hey, you know what? If that cost of that downtime that we're looking at right now, whatever that number is, is more than the part and um, the cost of whatever the space is, then we might want to have one on hand. It also means that if you're in a critical piece of equipment, that maybe if we know that this part fails every, you know, twice a year, so it fails about every six months, we might want to replace it every six months just, as, just to prevent the downtime. We can schedule the downtime to replace it and avoid that cost of loss of revenue. So the other thing we can use um, is we can use this to negotiate with vendors, right? Now, based on our cost, what we know our cost is going to be, we can uh, negotiate guaranteed available instead of keeping them on our shelf. Um, this is important, and I'm going to put in a side note that you want to make sure you get this in writing. But you can negotiate having always having this part available to you um, 100% of the time, 97% of the time, whatever it is. Uh, I would say 100% because I guarantee you that 3% of the time it would not be available would be the time you needed the part. But you can, especially if you have some, if you have any other contract with a, with a vendor, you can negotiate them having that part. Now, the back end of that means that you will only buy that part from that vendor unless they, for some reason, didn't have it available. But if they have it guaranteed available, that should never be a problem. Uh, and in some, some items, that's real easy for a vendor to do. Whether it is manufacturer or an independent service organization, you can make this happen. Um, you just have to talk about it and ask them, and they'll work with you to make it happen if you need it. Right? I also want to say that um, if you're going to get this, you're going to get them to hold some part for you. You're going to make sure that you've got it in writing, that they will have it available to you, have clear expectations and clear penalties for not having the part available. Now, when I say that, 
the reason that I say this is it's great if they have the part available, but if they don't have anybody to ship it out on a Saturday, the part's not really available on Saturday, right? Since shipping doesn't really happen on Sundays, we know that that's, that that would have to be counter to counter and you would have to negotiate whether or not uh, someone would come in on a Sunday and get that part out to you. If it's critical enough, I would think that you would want it to be done. Um, if you have a remote critical access hospital that has only one CT, uh, I would think that you would want to make sure that you had an x-ray tube that would could come out for that CT and be delivered door to door if you needed it to be via courier. Obviously, it'll co cost more, but it keeps you from having to divert. And in a critical access hospital, that might be pretty important. Right? So, let's go on to the cost of ownership. Now, before I talk about how to calculate the cost of ownership, this is important more often uh, to know what your cost of real cost of ownership is when you're going to spend capital dollars on new equipment, um, whether it's by model, whether it's by brand. You can break this out about any way that you want to. But there's some things that we sometimes miss when we try to calculate cost of ownership. One is the cost of manpower. Right? This is often missed. The cost of in-house service for that model or modality. Now, if you're running an in-house program and you are doing all of the service on whatever that model or unit is, then I would have to say you need to come up with what an hourly, an average hourly rate for your personnel is. That would include both the cost of their salaries, the cost of benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Most HR uh, departments will have uh, a number for that. And you can get your HR and they can tell you approximately what your average hourly rate would be. Right. You need to know the cost of all outside service labor. And here's the easy part, yeah, just add it together. So that gets your manpower costs. The cost of downtime. Now, as we've shown this before, it's the same formula. It's your mean time to failure. Right? It's your average downtime and your revenue. And that's your average. That's that's it. There's no magic to it. It's the same. It doesn't change. Right? Then, of course, cost of parts. Now, I, I kind of want to go on a little bit of a side um, comment here. That again, I talk about cost of parts. That might be an exchange rate. So, you know, we have somebody who fixes them and we just send it in, they send us one back. That might fall under parts or you might put it under manpower or outside services. Um, but you have to do it the same way over and over so that it, all your numbers come out the same. Right. So you want all the cost of all the parts that you used for that model uh, or that, depending on how specific you are, or maybe it's that manufacturer. If you're, if you're, uh, a medical center that has all GE and you're just looking for an average cost across the board, you can say, hey, what's our cost of ownership for everything in the hospital? You can, you can substitute that. But what I'm talking about now is simply, do we want to run a cost for all the uh, pumps in the hospital, all the uh, infusion pumps, all the feeding pumps? Do we want to, for all the CTs or just for a specific model of the CT? Do we want, um, it doesn't matter. Whatever that equipment is, you can make it as specific or general as you want, right? So then what we're going to do is we're going to put it all together, right? So it looks something like this, right? So we go manpower plus downtime plus parts, and we divide that by unit years, plus the yearly depreciation of all units, which is also often miss missed, but you can also get that from HR will equal your average yearly cost of ownership per unit. That's yearly, right? If we want to calculate total cost of ownership, we do the manpower plus the downtime plus the parts plus the initial cost of all the units uh, divided by the number of units. That equals your average unit cost of ownership to date. Now, I want to point out what the big difference is here. The reason we use yearly depreciation of all units instead of the cost of all units is we show how much we have expected that unit to have been, how much of the value was lost in the unit in the number of years that we've had. 
So that's why the unit years are, are brought in there as well. Um, these are numbers that will help uh, your, F you know, your CFO and people doing capital purchase. To most of us sitting in the office, we calculate this for them to help them make decisions. Right. Okay, yeah, I'm doing fine on time. I just wanted to check and make sure I'm not way behind. All right, so let's talk about the practical use of this data. Right. So first of all, we can assist with capital purchase decisions, just as I was saying. Right. The big thing is what you have to remember, what problem are they trying to solve? Are they trying to figure out which manufacturer to go with? Are they trying to figure out which model to go with? Um, and depending on what they're asking for, depends on how we calculate that data. So we may break it out by manufacturer. We may break it out by modality. Right? We, um, we may break it out very specific or very broadly. And some examples of that may be if you have two hospitals within a system that one runs one brand of equipment and the other runs another brand of equipment, you may look at all that equipment that's under that one uh, manufacturer and compare it to the others, like total cost of ownership. Um, you may even just look at mean time to failure. So maybe total cost of ownership at hospital A is lower, but the mean time to failure at that same hospital is higher. And so then they have to figure out which item, you know, which piece of information has heavier weight in their decision, right? You're just supplying this information to help make that decision. All right. So avoiding point of sale service contracts. To do this, and this is typically, I'm going to point out, this is typically with um, bigger equipment, more expensive equipment, where they'll come in, they'll sell you something that's, you know, anywhere from, uh, typically I see it in items that are over a cost of an item that's over $10,000 all the way up to millions of dollars. They'll want to sell you a five-year contract that starts at the end of warranty. Maybe it's only three, but regardless. We're going to modify all the numbers we've just talked about and only include the first five years of the equipment. So even if we have, uh, let's say, three units, Right, we're only going to increase the. We're only use the first five years for this specific uh, consideration. So that would be 15 unit years, because we only want to see how much work, how much cost we have in the first five years, and we should be able to show because typically you're able to show that it is cheaper to go time and material or in house with training um, for the first five years of any large item because it's still new. It's not breaking down as much. Right, and that ties into what I originally said, which is if you have units that are older, it'll change your data. Right. We also can use this data to negotiate contracts. Now, how do we do that? Well, first of all, most basically, we can show the cost of ownership shows if, you know, it actually saves you money. There are situations where a full coverage Cadillac contract will save you a lot of money uh, compared to schools and uh, the cost of your personnel, and then the average downtime. Um, I see this a lot in more remote hospitals. Uh, sometimes a full-service contract, whether it's with manufacturer or independent service organization, will save you money over trying to manage that item in-house. And typically, these are where you have one-offs. Even if you're in a um, major hospital, you may find that you only have one or two items uh, of that particular model or make, and that it is just simply cheaper to have it maintained um, by capturing all the costs uh, by having it maintained by some other service, an outside service. Uh, it might also be cheaper just to go time and material. But this is the way that you can figure out which one of these things uh, actually is going to save you money. Um, and it helps you decide where your contract money should go, where your outside service money should go, and where your training dollars should go. But in that, if you go to negotiate the contract, you can say, well, I know what this cost actually is. And you can see if you can negotiate the contract so that it makes it does actually save you money. Right? So meantime to failure for a specific
specific location may allow you to negotiate um, a low use rate for a contract. This specifically, the first time I ran across this was a uh, CT that was used in oncology. And it was, I mean, it, it did cases every day, but it was nowhere near the number of cases you would expect to see in a normal average CT. So we were able to negotiate a low use rate. Um, some manufacturers even now have a low use rate built into some of their uh, contract um, contract tiers. So you have different tiers of contract. One is a low use rate. Um, you can always ask about that if you have something that's being used, but not very much. Right. And then um, you can also use this to help calculate staff. So if you look at it on a big scale like a year, it'll give them an idea of so your, your mean time to fill, how many times, what your downtime is, and your cost of ownership. That may also show you what you need for staff, whether it be um, it can help with op operational staff, but mostly do you have enough people in your in-house program? Do you have enough people to service the equipment, or are you spending money having outside services come in when you should have someone in-house to take care of it? All right. So uh, I'm going to wrap up here shortly, but I, I want to point out, and this is um, real important, that this data uh, it can be manipulated uh, to meet your needs. So the big thing is what is the problem you're trying to solve? What is the question that's being asked of you? Uh, what are you at being asked to help make a decision on? Right, That will adjust um, what numbers you're using. Just like uh, when I said if you want to avoid the point of sale uh, service contract, you would limit your unit years to five times the number of units instead of using all of your unit years. Right, You can modify this in any number of ways to meet your specific question. Um, I have been asked in the past, you know, what's our cost of ownership for the first two years instead of five? In that case, I used, you know, two unit, two unit years per unit only and, you know, calculated it out that way, right? Uh, the big point is you don't have to be limited to what I've shown you today. You can actually use this basic concepts to apply to whatever situation you're trying to answer or solve. And hopefully in the long run, what you'll be able to do is add value besides just being able to fix a piece of equipment, right? You'll be able to help with the decision making in the hospital and provide a service that makes you more valuable uh, overall. And in short, in long term, I should say in long term, that will help you to improve the healthcare system overall, because if we're all doing this, we can improve the cost to value ratio of the services that we're giving to the end customer, which is a patient. And all of us have or will be a patient at some time. Or if we're not, for whatever reason, someone we know and care about will be. Um, and we wanna make sure that they're getting the best care, the best technology for the best price. All right, and so that ends my um, actual presentation. So I, uh, I guess I am ready for questions. Great, thank you so much, John. I've got a couple of questions here. Um, this data can be used to, to determine how many of a specific device is needed. Right, okay, so it can help determine that. There are a number of other things that will have to be answered. Um, this tells you in a perfect world how many devices you would need. Uh, if everything ran the same way all the time, then yes, this would actually answer that question. It would say, hey, we need we actually need um, you know, 50 units or 20 units or 10 units, but because there are other factors such as staffing ab uh, availability, uh, actual, um, obviously actual, co uh, excuse me, capital dollar limitations, um, and uh, there are some things that are still certificate of need. So in general, it helps. It's one tool that you can offer. It does not give you the final answer to that question. And you also talked about uh, standardization. How important is that for calculations? Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, standardization is crucial, crucial to standardization, uh, to all these calculations. Every calculation we make assumes that when we say this model, 
that we have all of the items that fit that model are listed in our database as that model. That they're not listed as something slightly different or something completely different. Um, that's why it's important to make sure that they're spelled the same way, that they, there's only one way to enter them, enter them into the database. This is why that person that I was speaking about, the keeper of data, regardless of what title you give them, they are so very important because the QA or quality assessment of your database will uh, either make or break every calculation you have. Okay, that's great, John. Now we're, we're coming up to the end of our time. Um, so thank you again, John, for a really great and informative webinar. Um, and thank you again to today's sponsors, Oxford Instruments Healthcare. One lucky attendee will win an Amazon gift card for completing the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. Now, you must complete the survey to, to obtain your certificate of attendance. For more information about our upcoming webinars, please visit our website, webinarwednesday.live. Thanks again for joining us today and hope to see you next time. Enjoy the rest of your day.